So, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Patrick McCaffrey. Um, I study Fiore, and uh, the class today is the Four Pillars of Teaching HEMA, or Managing Expectations. This class is irregardless of system, but it's all about how we go about teaching in HEMA, because there's more than one thing that we teach in HEMA. Um, what we're going to be going over is we're going to start with what the four pillars are. And the four pillars very briefly are instruction, skills improvement, coaching, and training. Uh, we're going to manage expectations using those four pillars, and we're going to get into a little bit of curriculum building, both in theory and in practice. So, the four pillars, very basically, are instruction, skills coaching, yeah, skills coaching or skills improvement, coaching, and training. So instruction is the transmission of information. I have knowledge, I'm giving you that knowledge. This is how you cut a fendente. This is how you cut a chrome. If you don't have that information, I need to give you that information. This is an instructional teaching. Skills co coaching or skills improvement is improving that skill. Going from here's how you do a pendente to here's how you do a pendente well. Yeah. Here's the problems that you're running into and how to fix them. Um, thrusting is a great one. The mechanics of thrusting are simple. Point on line, step. It's not so simple to pull off. We need to improve that action. Uh, coaching is in situ improvements. This is like sideline coaching. Um, essentially, you go to a tournament, you go to free sparring, you're doing a thing, your coach says, okay, this is what's happening, do this instead. It's like skills improvement, but it's in the moment. It is no longer do this thing, get better at the skill. It's now you're in the situation, here's how to do the best in the situation. And then the fourth pillar is training or physical fitness. That's physical conditioning. Push-ups, pull-ups, running, um, lifting weights, cardio, hit, all that fun stuff. Um, because the physical conditioning is a part of HEMA, but it's also a distinct part. So, again, instruction is designed to give information. This is how to do it, how to do it, how to do ideas and techniques. And it's primarily focused on gaining previously unknown information or increasing comprehension of that information. We talk about, um, for looks in our tradition, we talk about doing the Zorn Hound and the Zorn Orcs and the plays that follow it. Well, I can teach you the Zorn Hound. And I can teach you the Zorn how and I, Zorn or and I can teach you the plays that follow it. And then I can give you the text itself and read the text and increase your understanding. That's still an informational exchange. Um, so again, instruction it's primarily information based and it's knowing the thing or knowing how to do the thing. Skills coaching or skills improvement is designed to improve a skill, a set of skills, or application of a technique. These skills include things like distance, timing, measure, mobility, balance, footwork, posture, body fluency. Um, and it's, we can design skills or design drills to work on one or multiple skills at a time. Uh, it's application focused, it's required, it requires already understanding the instructions given. It does not need to be super complicated in the instructions that you're giving, but you need to understand it in order to start improving the skill. I can't improve distance and timing on the thrust if you don't already know how to do the thrust. Um, it also improves like, personal understanding of previously taught techniques. 
Coaching, in situ coaching. Uh, you should do this thing now. Sideline coaching, direct sparring, it's, it's any time you're telling somebody who's actively doing a thing, hey, you're facing Josh Fred. Don't get in close with him. He's going to grab you and throw you to the ground. Um, it's external instruction when fighting, either to improve a skill or a technique, or improve the outcome of a match. More points, winning a match, feeling better about how you fought in that match. Uh, coaching is very individualized. If you if you're coaching somebody, you need to know how they get coached. If they're uh, if there's somebody who needs very technical information, you need to give them technical information so that they can make a tactical decision. If there's somebody who just needs somebody behind them going, yay, yay, go, go, that's a valid coaching. And some people need that. So coaching, uh, sideline coaching is very individualized. And then physical training. Physical training is physical improvement. It's non-system specific. Um, it's things like weight training, cardio, high intensity interval training. Which physical training is best? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to fight faster? Are you trying to get stronger? Are you trying to last longer in a fight? Um, high intensity interval training is, in my personal opinion, best for Hi John. Is best for uh, sword fighting in general because it hits strength and endurance uh, with short recovery time. But you can't go wrong with cardio, weightlifting, anything, unless you do it wrong. It gets complicated. But for training, and I don't do as much training as I'd like to, but for most physical fitness training, it's just about doing something to improve yourself outside of just sword fighting. Best way to get better at sword for yeah, best way to get better at sword fighting is to do more sword fighting, intentionally and constructionally. Best way to... But, you can also improve your sword fighting by doing not sword things. And that's the idea of physical training, cross training. So, comparing the four pillars to other sports and other aspects. In HEMA, instruction is learning how to swing a sword. In football or baseball, it's learning how to throw, throw a curveball or learning how to tackle. Um, and we see this difference between football and HEMA because in HEMA we're doing instruction as adults. Some of us get very lucky and get to start a little bit younger, but for a lot of us, we're learning these things as adults because, and we sort of gloss over that there's this information, there's this action that I don't really know. But like learning how to tackle, learning how to throw a curveball, uh, learning the different positions on the field. That's something that most kids get to learn early so they already know, oh, I know how to throw, now I'm throwing a curveball. So that transmission of information is, uh, we learn it earlier in other sports, but it's still there. Skills improvement, it's things like improving distance and time. In football or baseball, it's drilling formation or batting practice. Um, to get better at batting, you bat more. Um, for coaching, you have that sideline coaching, directed sparring, somebody in your corner saying, hey, you're doing well, do this thing. For football or baseball, we got your Eric, uh, Andy Boones and Andy Reeds and Aaron Boones, the uh, coaches on the side saying, okay, go do this formation now. Okay, swing for it, you know, aim for the bleachers, or bunt, or get the shift on. Um, so you still see that coaching both in HEMA and in professional sports. Actually more so in professional sports than we do in HEMA.
Uh, training, hitting the gym. Same for both. So now what? I have just transmitted this information about these four pillars. What can we do with that information? Using those four pillars, the idea of, am I doing instruction? Am I doing coaching? Am I doing skills improvement? Am I training the person? We can now manage expectations. We can design a curricula based on what we're trying to do. Are we primarily conveying information? Then it's instruction. If, are we trying to make students better at doing the thing? Then it might be skills coaching. It might be coaching in situ. Or it might be training. And the lines get a little fuzzy. Because we can be doing multiple things at once. Are we teaching a technique from things that you already know? And we can improve a skill by teaching something else. So, first, the uh, teaching a new technique from something you already know. The idea of throwing a fendente, or throwing an overhow, versus throwing a zornhow. Um, you can drill and improve that overhow, skills improvement, by having them do this action. And then you give them a little bit more information and say, okay, we're gonna change things a little bit. And all of a sudden you're not just doing an overhaul, but you're cutting into opposition. So we can be teaching a technique through skills improvement. So we're conveying information while improving something else. Uh, we can also improve a skill by teaching a new game. Uh, the one that I always do is uh, the machete game with my students, which is just a, you have a machete, I'm going to feed attacks, I'm not going to try to hit you, but I'm feeding the attacks, you just need to walk, and if the blade is on this side of the body, that leg's back. Blade's on this side of the body, that leg's back. And it's a game, and it's this machete game, I taught this machete game, and they're working on that machete work, and suddenly their footwork is starting to get better. They're moving offline. They're stepping across. And then they go back to uh, two-handed sword fighting or rapier fighting. And then all of a sudden, when they were stepping offline and it looks something like this, they're stepping offline now looks this and they're stable because they now improved their posture, their balance, and their footwork through this other thing. Uh, dagger hell helping with body flow and so um, Taking a dagger class or doing a grappling class improves knowing where your body is in space. Wow. And, you know, we get to see improvement in understanding of sword fighting by teaching how to move your body with a dagger or with grapple. Uh, we can have training as a consequence. All right. Time for push-ups. Time for burpees. Because, oh, you just walked in front of me as I have a sword out talking to the person here and you just walked right in between us. All right. Everybody do 10 push-ups. So you get that physical training as a consequence of an action. Oh, we're doing a drill where you're aiming to my, hit my head, and you're swinging over here. All right. We need to correct that, and to remind you to do that, we're also going to do push-ups. Uh, and all of it is 100% valid. We can do anything as long as we're managing the expectations of ourselves and our students. We can combine as much as we want. So, with that, we can now start building a set of curricula. How detailed do you need to be? Start with the broad strokes. Uh, start with an end goal in mind and set goals. Make sure the goals are smart. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Um, you know, having a goal of I will win gold medal 
That long point, 2025, when it finally comes back. Okay, that's a goal. Is it specific? Well, you got a gold medal at long point. Is it measurable? Can you measure your progress up until that point? Well, if I start meddling at other tournaments, ah, so we can start to measure our progress. Is it achievable? Maybe. I don't know who else is going to come up. But somebody has to win gold at a long point. Is it relevant to what we're doing? Well, I'm fighting Longsword. Long point 2025. It's going to come back. Sure it will. Yeah, it's relevant. Or I'm fighting Rapier. Or doing cutting. Or grappling. Or some weird other esoteric thing is going to come up and Long point 2025, single stick tournaments. Um, so yeah, that might be relevant. Time based, 2025. Oh, I gave it a year. So I now have four to five years to achieve this goal. Now, how am I going to do it? Use those uh, details to fill in the broad strokes. Okay. Goal at long point 2025. How do I get there? Well, if I just take every day, it's then inevitably going to happen. But how can I make sure that I'll get to that? And, you know, long point 2025 is a nice, uh, absurd example, but we can also apply that to building a class curriculum. For example, curricula, beginners, newbies, fundamentals. What are your goals? What are your goals in a new person class? Is it coming out of this fundamentals class? You can do all five hidden strikes. Okay, cool. How long will that take? One week. How many classes? One. How long are the classes? One hour. I don't think you're going to get through five hidden strikes in one hour, in one week. How often do you have classes? Once a week. So again, getting to that smart, specific, measurable, achievable. Is learning all five hidden strikes in one week achievable with somebody who's never picked up a sword? No. Is it possible to teach all five hidden strikes, maybe not the plays, but all five hidden strikes, to somebody who has experience with longsword, but just not German. Yeah, I can convey that information. Will they be good at it? Eh, probably not. Whatever their baseline skill level is. Um, how can you measure the effectiveness of your classes? So, with uh, my club, with Duarte, the fundamentals are just the fundamentals. It's descending strike from the right, descending strike from the left, ascending strike from the right, ascending strike from the left, middle blows of the sword, thrusting, uh, bind work, feeling two swords pressed together and being able to feel strong or soft, or strong or weak, soft or hard. Um, and I broke it down week by week. First week, descending blow from the right, and descending blow from the left. Second week, still working that descending blow, but we're now adding that step into it. We're making the movements. And we start parrying. We use this point back, sword high guard, and parry the incoming strike. Uh, measuring the effectiveness of the classes. I know the first class went well when I get to the second class and they're able to step and hit the mask without crushing anybody. Um, just use raw strokes. What are you teaching? Answer that question. And build the curriculum from there. Again, I got into this from the broad strokes, just break it down to class by class. And I usually like to start at the end 
and go, okay, my goal at the end of this is that you are able to understand me when I say to do this kind of strike. Uh, Alright, what's the last thing that I would want to teach them? Passwording. It's something you can do, and I want to give that information to them, so that's going to be the last thing. But before that, middle blows the sword. They're kind of complicated, you need to have some experience with the sword before that. What's before that? And then just class by class, all the way, all the way back to, oh, I'm now teaching them that descending blow. And then after you've built the curriculum, you review it, you reevaluate it. Was my ex expectation of timeliness correct? Well, yes and no. It took me the full eight weeks to get through everything, but this section I got done in half a class, and that section took me a class and a half to get through. Can I do it in less time? Do I need more time? Um, yeah, for that first part, I need less time. For that second part, need a little more time. Should I restructure things? Do I need to move things around? Can I cut things out until later? Oh, do I need to include some things that I forgot? No. Going, all right, I did half sorting. I forgot about the pommel. I forgot about the cross guard and why we don't use it, but how it is a valid thing to use. Um, and that constant reevaluation of what worked well this time, what didn't work last time. The way we've always done it. I teach this way because it's the way we've always done it. Entrenched ideals. We have some entrenched ideals. It's natural, it's common, everybody has them. Uh, especially the longer something goes, the more entrenched certain things become. And it's for better or worse. There are some things that become very entrenched. This is an overhaul. Okay. Nobody's going to really argue with that this is an overhaul. Might argue some semantics, but as we're going, it's like, you stuck with the cups. This is an overhaul. Um, and tradition is important. You walk in front of Sensei, you do five push-ups. Uh, but because that's how we've always done it, isn't enough. I have always stepped with my cup like this. Okay? Why? Because we've always done it that way. Is it a good cup? Reevaluate those entrenched ideas. On the other end of the spectrum, novelty for novelty's sake, things don't need to change just because. All right, we have been doing classes this way since the beginning of time. Or we've been doing classes this way for three months. Let's switch to something new. Why are we changing? Are we doing it just to do something new, or are we doing it for purpose? Uh, is everyone doing the same thing because that's just what they're familiar with, or because it works? You know, it's building a new curricula doesn't have to be a completely new thing, but it doesn't have to be completely the same on some um, So, talked about building a curricula and managing the expectations of the curricula. There are some special exceptions to the four pillars. Not everything falls neatly onto, this is instruction, this is skills improvement, this is coaching, this is physical fitness. Um, you can teach the hopstick without mentioning the hopstick. You can teach uh, streno plays without mentioning streno, without mentioning the sources at all. And it's just by, you know, having a drill where, okay, you're going to get closer. Now, as soon as you get to this point, what are some things you can do? And working through it, so you're making them think and they're improving the skill of getting closer and getting into the vine and working that vine. And then all of a sudden, they're doing something that is right out of the manual. It's trickery. Uh, we can use directed sparring as skills. We can use drilling as training. You know? 
All right, you two are going to spar. But thrusts are the only thing that scores. You're, you're doing sparring as skills improve. You're getting better at thrusting as I'm on the side going. All right, parry. Don't forget to parry. Get that thrust in. While I'm drilling his training. You know, you can... One of the uh, ways my intermediate class warms up is run around the room, and then we'll drill the uh, seven strikes of the sword, descending from the right, descending from the left, ascending from the right, ascending from the left, two middle blows, and thrust. And we'll do each of them ten times. Ten right over house, ten right from ten times. Ten left. And by doing them over and over, we're getting physically tired. We're increasing our fitness by breath. Teaching is hard. So, that is roughly everything that I wanted to get through. Any questions? What would you say the priority in using the four pillars? Can they all be treated roughly equal, or can some be more prioritized and less prioritized? For example, if someone's physical training is significant enough already, completely ignoring that. Or if someone has only interest in studying it as an art and historical uh, application, but mm -hmm. no interest in actively competing, but completely ignoring being able to endure an actual mm -hmm. Um That is... That was a little bit longer of uh, a question that I... So to break down, should there be emphasis on one pillar over another pillar? Yes, for what you're trying to do. Um, for somebody who is already very physically fit, no, I don't need to work on physical fitness. I don't need to work on training. But if I have a linebacker coming to me and going, I want to use a sword, I'm going to prioritize instruction with him because he doesn't know how to use a sword. He doesn't have the information that I have that he needs. But he's a football player. So by the time I'm done instructing him, he'll already have a skill level with what I'm giving him. Just because he knows his body, because he's an athlete. He doesn't have, you know, you give a football player a sword and give Travis Mayo a sword and say, all right, you guys are going to hit each other with the swords. The football player's going to go, I don't want to hurt him. And Travis goes, it's okay, you're not going to hit me. But then you give that uh, football player instruction. You give him the information, the knowledge. And you don't need to worry about the coach and you don't need to worry about the skills improvement. You don't need to worry about the training because you need to prioritize that information. Uh, with somebody who doesn't want to compete, but wants to understand and know the art, there's still a level of physical fitness that you need to instill in them. Just because bodies who do sword fighting are under work. They're doing something. So... You, yeah, you'll probably, actually, for the guy who doesn't want to compete, after you've given them the knowledge, or they might already have the knowledge, you'll work more on skills improvement. You don't need to worry about the coaching. The training, you don't want to completely ignore it, but you don't need to make it a focus. You just need to get the level of training to a point where if you and I are working through the manual and going through each technique, you know, not being gassed by the time we get to this workout. Um, but because they probably already have the knowledge and they have uh, like the, the words of the source in their minds, you're improving the ability to do the action. Um, 
teaching becomes very individualized and the person who doesn't want to do tournaments but wants to understand the art better if you say yeah come to class understand the art better you go to the completely new guy yeah come to class learn how to use a sword you go to the guy who is really into like sparring and tournaments yeah come to class we do lots of that too all of a sudden you have all four pillars showing up like or you know oh it's new year's your new year's resolution is to get in shape come to your sword fighting sword fighting gets you in great shape you all of a sudden have all four pillars showing up and it's like how do you build a class to get all four of them happy don't um and and i kind of use that example because i've heard from uh, other martial artists, like not just Tima, but some uh, Eastern martial artists that, you know, when they first started their dojo, started their club, they're like, get everybody in. I'll take them all. Om, nom, nom. Uh, and then they realized, oh, yeah, I'm getting 30 people at the start of every month, and I have two at the end. Because he wasn't able to manage the expectations or he was mismanaging the expectations of the club uh, for my club I specifically say this is a fundamentals class this is an instruction to improve the fundamentals of what you're doing yes. right descending left descending the footwork that goes along with it and you take it the first time you can go from not having picked up a sword to understanding the instruction for the intermediate class. You can go through it a second time. And the second time you go through it, things click a little bit better. Oh, that stepping through motion with that cut makes sense in this way now. And you get, you see different things the second time through. The same class, same focus on instruction, but because they have the knowledge already, they can improve their understanding. My intermediate class is going, okay, you, know, you understand how a sword works. I'm going to instruct you on Fiore. We're going through Fiore. Here are the guards. Here's what we do with them. Second time through, here are the guards. Here's what we do with them. And, you know, the play is after blah, blah, blah. But because of how I've uh, structured it, the second time through the intermediate cycle, you start going, oh, this is Boar's Tooth. Oh, I'm getting a lot better at that thrust from Boar's Tooth. And then we do a uh, skills improvement portion, because right now we meet once a week. So we've got three hours, hour of fundamentals, hour of intermediate, and an hour of free play or skills improvement. And that skills improvement will be anything from, let's do a machete game and get you really moving around to um, all right this person has been having issues with thrusting or breaking the thrust so we'll take the class and just break down thrusting break down breaking the thrust and improve a lot of other things in the attempt to improve breaking the thrust so does that answer the question you had? Uh, great questions. Do I have anything more that I want to do? Ah. So, if we want to, we can take time and actually build a curriculum. That's up to you. Would you like to? Let's try. All right, cool. And I'm going to turn this off. Oh, that one. Yep, that's the last slide. Awesome. So, uh, let's define the curriculum. What are the goals that you have for building a curriculum or building a class? Establishing a firm base in the art that I do. Okay. 
So, let's state the goals. You you want to establish a firm base. What does having a firm base in broadsword look like? Understanding the cuts, bearings, and basically. Okay. Um, which pillars are you working with here? Is it going to be primarily instruction, or are we going to get into some skills improvement? Yeah, the instructional with skills improvement. Okay. Um, How long do you have to do this? Two hours. Two hours. Over what time period? How many? Once. How many weeks do you want to dedicate to laying down this groundwork? About five. Five weeks. Okay, so you have two hours. Once a week, over the course of five weeks. So we have that end goal of understanding the cuts, parries, basic footwork. What should week five look like? Week five, they should be able to effectively use all of the cuts and parries as appropriate mm -hmm. with the appropriate advancing, retreating, shifting footwork with little correction. All right. So week five should probably be a uh, check in week where you take care of any small problems that show up. What's the last thing you would want to teach somebody when you're teaching them these fundamentals? Something that you feel is important to teach them and they should know, but it's going to be that last thing that you teach them because you need to have a base of knowledge to get to that point. Concept of timing. Alright. Okay. So the concept of timing will be the last thing that you're teaching them. And timing will come up before them because it always does, but the actual concept of timing will be the last teachable note moment. Okay, we're going to be jumping back and forth from the beginning to the end, from the end to the beginning and back until we meet in the middle and then flesh it all out. What's the first thing that you would want to teach them? Them how to the, the stance of their body, how to feel their balance, and be able to firmly sit down and exercise. All right. How long would that take you? Instructionally, very little time, but depending on the person, possibly one part. So, you can go anywhere from 15 minutes teaching this concept to two hours. So, you need to talk to Rebecca about that. <laughs> Give me a moment to wrap up my class and we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> so, we have our, the last thing we want to teach time and the first thing we want to teach, feeling comfortable in your body. What's the second to last thing that you'd want to teach? Yeah, <laughs> Okay. So timing distance opening. Um, how long do you want to dedicate to the timing and looking for openings and reading the opponent? Okay. So we can take that for that as week five. Balance and feeling comfortable week one. So what will what should week two look like? Movement in the, the four cardinal directions while maintaining that balance and stance. Mm -hmm. Advancing the three day diversions. Alright. Are you going to teach them any cuts yet? Not yet. No. Alright. Cool. So that's week two. Movement 
while maintaining posture, while having that balance. What should week four look like? Four was the flowing with all the cuts, going from one to two to three without significant stoppages in the Okay. <laughs> so, week one bounce, week two, four cardinal directions and movement. Week four is flow within the action. Week five is distance timing, seeing the opening and doing something. So what's left for week three? Week three, heaviest would be the structural period of this is, these are these huts. These are how they're made. This is how my now we're doing this, I feel that week three may be perhaps too much information for one class. Mm -hmm. Which, if I'm thinking now, I can either expand the time and add in extra classes, or I can divide up the cuts to the second class movement and cuts one and two, mm -hmm. then three and four. Five to six, so that by the end the instruction has been spread out and is not condensed into one class containing all of these very vital information of how to do things. Yep. So we got we went through all five weeks, went, okay, maybe I need to relook at this. So th that's building a curriculum. You go have an endpoint. What's the last thing I need to teach them? What's the first thing I need to teach them? Second to last? For second thing. And then come to that center. Look at how it all fills out and go, okay, let me redo this. And then you, you have all the pieces, now you're just going. And I like working from the end to the beginning for my last time through. So you have all these pieces, you know all the stuff that you want in there. So start at the end and go to the beginning and see what filters out what makes you go, hmm, okay, maybe I need more time with this. Maybe I, maybe I can do more than one thing at a time. Um, yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Uh, any questions? Cool. Well, then I'm going to say thank you. And that'll be it.